Oh, it's hot up here. No, I ran. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Armory Show and to Armory Live. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's talk, From Investment to Connoisseurship, Debating Major Shifts in Collecting. Bringing together a diverse cast of notable art world figures, this panel will examine the question, what does it mean to be a collector today? Charting major shifts in the art market from its global proliferation through art fairs, social media, and increasing speculation from investors, how has the notion and practice of collecting changed over the last quarter century? What are the mid and long-term effects of these shifts? And what role does the art community at large play in cultivating connoisseurship over investment? This discussion will be moderated by Melanie Gerlis, art market journalist for the Financial Times. There will be a short period at the end for some questions and answers, but in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Melanie and her panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Armory. And thank you all for coming today. Um, I think this is a very pertinent topic uh, for this point in time. Um, there's a lot of noise around us all. Um, auction sale volumes have tripled since 2000. There are nearly 300 art fairs a year. Um, that's six, six a week. If you wanted to go to six a week, you can do that. You, you probably do. Um, thousands of exhibitions and talks like this and newspaper articles and constant social media posts demanding our attention. There's a question of how we all cope. Um, but also what we're here to discuss today, and to borrow a phrase from Sean Kelly, um, is how do you collect wisely in this environment? Um, I've got the most fantastic panel of experts uh, today. I'm really honored. Um, and I will introduce them to you starting uh, just on my right here is Lisa Schiff, who is the president and founder of Schiff Fine Art, which is an art advisory business. Um, next to her, we have Dan Salek, who is a collector, who will tell us a bit more about his collection. Um, but he's also chair of the board of trustees of the Hershorn Museum in DC, where he's from. Next to him is another very renowned collector, Pedro Barbosa, who has come here from Brazil, um, and will also tell us a little more about his collecting and how it's changed. Next to him is Naomi Begel, who is the managing director at the art lender Athena Fine Art. Um, and then at the end, as I've already mentioned, um, is the gallerist Sean Kelly, who has a brilliant booth in this fair with Kehinda Wiley and David Clabart, and well, go and see it. I would definitely recommend it. Um, as Julia said, uh, I will open it up to questions at the end, but uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask my ones first. So Lisa, can I start with you? Um, can you help me frame our discussion um, uh, by telling me, you know, what do we all mean when we talk about connoisseurship? And how and why is it now separate from investment? Um, first of all, I think it's interesting that you put from investment to kind of connoisseurship because I feel like it should be the other way around. <laughs> um, but that gives me hope. Um, I think actually what is most interesting right now is that the way that value is made is a little bit in crisis and in flux. So in my thinking, um, criticality, so critical value and monetary value should be linked together and had heretofore been, and I, I sense they're, they're pulling apart. Um, and that creates a, a, a lot of confusion about what to buy, what not to buy. I think there's a misperception of liquidity in the market that's not real. So there's a hyper focus on trends. I feel I could actually open a business like a fashion house trend um, analyst and tell you to buy red this week and I might do very well. And that's a, a bummer. Um, so I think that's a bit where we are. And did you want to talk oh, yes. through some of your slides? 
Um, and I, I would just illustrate... <laughs> By way of example. It's on here as well. Okay, great. Um, no, just to give an illustration um, would be to look at auction houses. I think there's an over... I mean, listen, it just like the art world ecosystem is fragile and precious, so I don't mean to be critical of any one part of it because I think we can all be very hypercritical of one another. The auction houses are actually a really important part of how value is made, but I feel there's been some manipulation and irresponsibility. Um, for example, um, at an auction last fall, there were, was at Phillips this painting by Cause, who um, I hope is not in the audience, and I'm sure if he is, he is a lovely human being <laughs> and makes very interesting products. Um, if for me, it doesn't fit into my purview of art history and art historical relevancy. And, and yet, like, there has been a hyper focus on his market and a huge hike in his prices, always at auction, also off auction, but it, it creates a certain amount of trending. At the same time, as this painting came up at auction, and I should say the auction house actually took a picture of this blew it up like over life size and put it in the window. I, do we, I think we have a picture of that. Oh. Not there, but if you go, no, we don't. No, so if you go back, um, this was like in the front window. Oh, and over the top of it was an amazing, important painting by Wayne Tebow, who for me is like an American master. So I find this problematic in the sense that the auction house is plugging something and the power they have to put in your consciousness about what this is and how important it is, is not just reflected in where they hung this inside the auction, that they put it in the evening sale, but that they also blew it up and like gave it a better position than Wayne Tebow. And that that is a marker of value. If you're in an evening sale, you're, well, if you're important with a capital I. 100%, and if you don't know anything about art and you're just flipping through the catalog, or you're just entering and you're just like relying on the brand of the auction house to guide you. And I'm quite certain, and although I don't know for sure, but I believe this is actually owned by somebody in the art market that's quite powerful with the auction houses and is able to leverage their power to also create this position in the, in the auction house. So for me, this is terrifying because I care about historical relevancy, I care about a visual, be, something being visually or conceptually compelling. I'm also pretty sure that this is a slightly referring to Fat Albert and a um, Cosby show. Hmm. And so considering everything that's happening in the world, that this, that, um, what is his first name? Bill, Cos Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby had been roofing women and um, is going to prison, that this is blown up in the window and not a single person protested. Nobody said anything about this and it sold for a record price. This for me is like alarming and it, it really the dumbing down of, of the art world. And you said just before that, that, you know, you like historical context and visual. Is, is that what we mean by connoisseurship? I think that in the art world there are all these different forces that come together to create value. A lot of it is ground zero nonprofits, museums, gallery shows, like content context, but also coming from the art itself. It's, it's complicated, and when you study it all the time as a collector or gallerist or a, an art lender, you're in it and you can sort of follow how it works. But right now it's working along other, other means. Thank you. Thank you. And Dan, I mean, I'd love you to pick up a bit on some of that, but also, I mean, can you tell us what you collect? Um, and also, how do you how do you avoid all this noise that, that we're talking about? Sure. So I, I've been collecting for about 15 years, and um, I am by no means a mega collector. I'm just going to put that out there. But, but I've collected some good things, and I want to show you two things that I have collected up on the screen. Uh, one, of course, is the only marble Brancusi sleeping muse, and the other is a Van Gogh self-portrait, which is not bad for kind of a nobody <laughs> collector. 
Um, so for this discussion, I wanted to introduce a concept How that I've... How are you I've, not a collector? Well, you know, <laughs> I've been lucky. So I want to introduce a concept here for this discussion that I think actually might drive us towards this point about connoisseurship. So if you go to the next slide, I've sort of invented this theory, which is how I learn about art, which is I call the museum of your mind. And the point I guess I would make is that I've, after 15 years of collecting, after going to all these art fairs and seeing a lot of the same things over and over, I've gotten into the mindset of um, really trying to understand and learn about artworks that I can never really own. And I have looked at this as something where there's a collective ownership. Both these pieces are in Washington, D.C., where I live. And every time they're out, I study them, I read about them. And in some ways, it actually informs how I collect other artists who are looking at those masters. And I, I think as we think about this term connoisseurship, I think we can't just talk about buying art. I think we've got to talk about our involvement with museums and public institutions and really committing to them and also about studying and loving art that you, you just can't own or buy. And I think there's a lot to that. I think it's a discipline in some ways to, to love art that you can never buy. And uh, so that's kind of my, my theory of the case. I love, your, I love your theory. But and, I mean, who are the artists you have collected on this? Who, who well, were the, fit I'll, in with well, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So, you know, the Brancusi, which has been is on view at the Hirshhorn quite a lot. You know, I, I've always thought about the, the material and how um, it's, it's just linked back so far in art history. And then, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so, I, I got very interested in the, the artist Ai Weiwei, and he created a marble replica of the surveillance camera that the Chinese government put out in front of his uh, studio when he was under house arrest and turned it into an object that clearly had some notional lineage to something like Sleeping Muse. And, you know, and, and the same is true of an artist that Sean represents I've collected, um, Jose de Vila, who when you look at his sculptures, somewhere in there he's clearly thinking about Brancusi's studio. And so I like to think about it as what can we learn from these uh, great works that are in museums or in other people's collections that you can take into the art that you can collect and live with. And does that, did it help you? Is it almost, it's almost like a sort of mindfulness um, that, that when you're getting a million emails from galleries every week, do you, do you consciously sort of shut the computer and say, I'm just going to think? No, I look at them all. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but look at them all. But, it, but it becomes a question of um, time and space and budget and how many walls you have and how much art do you actually need. And you start to think about, okay, you've got art on most of your walls you know, what do you do now? How do you think about engaging with art? And that's where I also think the, the connection to museums and other places where you can get involved in art actually improve your level of connoisseurship because you're learning about all kinds of different perspectives, not just what you're learning going up and down the halls of an art fair or, or just going to galleries. It's, it's like you're getting a 360 perspective. I do actually, I remember Lisa at, at, a, at another talk in London around freeze time, um, someone asked you, you know, what, how should I, um, how should I start collecting? And you said, don't buy art, just give your money, you know, to maybe a grassroots organization or get involved in a museum's patrons program to start with. So maybe that's on the same, it's, it's sort of thinking slightly outside this transactional market. Thank you very, very much. Pedro, could you also, um, again, picking up on that, could you tell us a little bit about your collection? And also, could you tell me, is, is the situation the same in Brazil? I mean, has uh, in this investment to connoisseurship path? Well, this, uh, first I would like to show uh, yes. this slide. Uh, the Can next you, one, please. Okay. Uh, we are talking about value, right? Um, the other day I heard from Massimo Minini that uh, he said, someone asked him, what's the value? He said, I don't know what's the value, I know how much it costs. <laughs> okay. So, and this is a clear example. Uh, I don't know what's the value, I know what it, how much it I paid for you. it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what is it? Yeah. It's, 
Well, the artist. I can artists, see the title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the artist pee in a bucket, uh -huh. and then the artist drew a square. You know, and then you can have you know a number of narratives like inside or outside of the feminine body. You know. Uh, inside or outside uh, uh, on the society, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm not, I'm not going to go deep like in that this. Have you, you seen know? the film The Square? You yeah, yeah. See it. It's like that. It's like <laughs> well, the square. And this is the kind of approach we have. You know, so I don't know what what the value is. No, I know how much it's, it costs, it's... and I actually don't want to know <laughs> what the value is as long as it fits in the in the collection, in the narrative of the collection, okay? But uh, talking more about Brazil, yeah, we, we do have people that really um, do intensive research, mm -hmm. but I also can say that there's a lot of speculation around, yes. okay? Uh, and it's a closed market, as some of you know, and this actually, uh, makes the speculation environment more vivid. Okay, Be because okay. there's a limited number uh, of works that can be traded, or why? Why? No, does because that you know we really close the market there for you know foreign artists. You know we have a, a big uh, import tax yes. for you know for foreign artworks that can be as as big as sixty percent. So, you know, this, this all helps us to stay isolated, you know. So you rarely will find, you know, Brazilians coming here and buying upcoming American artists, you know. They, they stay on shore. And, and this is but very there was, sad. There was, there was speculation, I think, in Brazilian artists out, outside of Brazil as well. I think there was a time when we all got very excited about the brick countries in art. But the Brazilians were buying. Okay. They're fine. You know, the, the auction market here gets really hot, you know, but the players are Brazilians. But then did you, did you start, did you always start out quite conceptually or did you start in maybe a more speculative it's fashion? It's been quite uh, conceptual. Uh, and politically engaged. You know, there's always you know, a subject, a hidden subject that has a political engagement. You know, like in this work, you have a, you, know, you can tell many stories. Like, on the other hand, you have the Hans Hacke before he was, you know, uh, deep into um, political engagement. But there is a similarity. Both works, you know, deal with. Uh, physics that well, the first one evaporates and disappears and the work doesn't exist anymore. You know, you have to start the process of peeing all over again in the bucket and drawing. <laughs> and, and this one, you know, has a life of itself, you know, that doesn't even need a spectator. And this is the beauty of the work. In order to activate the work, it needs only the weather. The weather outside. So you don't have to look, uh, you know, it evaporates, you know, it condensates, and so on and so forth, according to the, to the outside temperature. So here we exclude the audience, we exclude the audience totally. I love it. And I'm by the way, I saw one in a Hirschhorn, a condensation <laughs> cube, like a few months ago, yeah. last year, right? Exactly. You have a gigantic condensation yeah. cube there. I, I want to know if, if Naomi would ever value conceptual art, but we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Would you value evaporating piss? Anyway, I'll ask you that. I'll ask you that. That wasn't on my list of questions, was it? I'll ask you that later. Um, but Naomi, sorry. Um, uh, you, you work at the intersection between art and money. Um, wh what do you see as the relationship between connoisseurship and investment? And do you think they're, are they necessarily mutually exclusive? Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Oh, and can I you think, just move the microphone? I think yeah. that people get into art through various pathways. Some come through it from a very kind of sourceship, very academic background. And at the end of the day, what we really want, I think, is for all people to participate within the art world at whatever level they want. And what the beauty about these art fairs are 
is that it allows people to get over the threshold of their fear for going into a gallery. You know, when you go into a gallery, a lot of times the desks are high up, you can't see the people behind, you don't necessarily get the new people coming in, and it's a really nice wave of traffic here at the art fairs for people to actually get that exposure. And there has always been this underlying, you should always buy what you love as opposed to what the value is. But I come from an auction background, now I'm in the lending space and I can tell you the conversations with collectors when they're trying to sell art or borrow money, uh, f uh, get, lend money against their artworks, they start with the valuation and sometimes contentiously, very quickly, end with the valuation process because people want to know that they've purchased something that might have value beyond the day that they've purchased it. Um, galleries love to give them to good collections or even museum institutions, and when they're trying to get new collectors, we'll often use that dialogue to get those new collectors to want to maybe purchase something higher than they normally would or get them over the threshold to start collecting by knowing that these artists are in these very prestigious collections. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think they do converge. And I think it's an important part that they do because otherwise the transaction part, which is what everybody kind of engages in, as opposed to going to museums, which I do think, and kind of sourceship you need to do. The kind of sourceship is more about opening your eyes, as he was saying, to look at all the other artworks, to see if you can make the connections of the current from the past and, and really expose your eye and to learn. As Lisa said, maybe early on before you begin to collect, just educate your eye, learn. But it does matter that things do increase in value because people, I think, at the end of the day, want that. But how do you, how do you measure what you're lending? Like, are you only looking at auction results? Interesting question. I've we got, start, actually, got, we have, a, we have a database actually that helps us underwrite our, our, underwrite our loans. And we do look at the, the auction records because they're the first basis and of course they're public information. And you can get much more information from that. We do the top three auction houses. But I've been in the business a long time and I know appraisers because we have to appraise all the works of art for marketable cash value. And as you know, or you may not know, there's various different levels of valuations. There's insurance value, which is replacement. There's fair market value, which people do for donations. There's auction estimates. There's marketable cash value for art lending. And they, they differ, and especially with the insurance values. They differ quite, they quite directly. But when we get an appraisal, we start with the auction records. But then I go to the appraisers that actually transact with the artists that we're looking to lend against. Because there is another layer that you need to add to that, and it's unfair sometimes to just go by auction records. Some galleries don't like their artists to go to auction and they sell much more frequently and much better at the gallery rather than at auction. So we don't just go by that record. And you, but you, I mean, you, we, when we were discussing it, you said one of the, actually auction records can be a bit of a problem because collectors, owners of art tend to think that what they own is worth more than you would probably say it was worth. Is that something that's a problem? Well, well it's, it's a double-edged sword. When, when you're lending money against art, it's, it's really the value is what the seller would put in their pocket. So it's after all the taxes are taken out, the commissions are taken out, so it's not the retail value. They have in their head oftentimes, I could sell this. Um, I'll give you an example. There was, there was a woman um, or a collector that we almost did a, a loan for, and she had a, a Picasso painting that was valued at around $20 million, but she only needed $2 million of a loan. And so I said, oh, well, we can lend you $10 million against, you know, we do 50% loan to value, so it was 20 million, we can give you 10. And she was like, but this is a $30 million painting. I'm like, but you only need $2 million. So <laughs> it doesn't matter that I'm giving you 10, you still have room, but they do have in their mind where they feel the value is. And the value, to your point, is not inherently just about the, the cash value. It's about the emotional value and a variety of other things. But when you come to the auction market, or you come to a lending facility, it really does boil down to what that artist makes over time and time again, not the Which, outliers that are the high or the low, but, one, but really what they consistently one thing transact I was, at. One thing I was going to say, and I, I don't want to cut off Sean because I know he'll <laughs> come in strong on this. It, you know, just thinking about Pedro is when you think about how perverse this conversation is about money and lending, and I think about a, a Brazilian artist that we collect that I love, um, Ernesto Neto, you know, very hard, almost impossible to sell his work. It's very low priced, except he will have museum shows 
from now until the time he's 90. Uh, massive pieces in museums, engaging. And his primary market sells out. Yeah, and his primary market sells out, so it's sort of a strange mm. thing that happens here when you talk about value when museums all over the world covet working with this artist, yet his prices are below what I would say, you know, some brand new 35 year old artist. It's like your Hans Hacke, which mm. could run circles around the cause painting and should be lent against way better, but it won't be. And that's the issue. Because on an, any given day, at any given moment, almost 99.9% .9 of art is worth zero. It just is. It's about selling, it's very complicated. There's this other intrinsic value. I wouldn't call it emotional. I would just call it the cumulative value yes. or, or of quali amazing quality. Yes. Yeah. I mean, quality, really. And so I do think this lending thing has become problematic because it sets up these expectations of, of liquidity, really. Like, I can cash out today. Like, what does that mean? We're not asking people to cash out. We're actually asking people to keep their artwork and use the, the leverage that they can to actually either acquire new art or do other kinds of things that they but want to do. But you're lending, though. It's like, you're, what are you going to give, you know, Pedro for his Hans Haka? I'm just saying. $35 million. <laughs> <laughs> that's all he asked. Sorry, I think I mean, actually we will. That's, that's what no, I call uh, liquidity. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wonder. Uh, and the other piece, you're clearly taking the piss with that one. So. Exactly. <laughs> I wonder how much I can raise with the piss. <laughs> we, will, we will come back to it because I think, I mean, what we're talking about is possibly there are two markets and definitely two values, or at least two. There are lots of value systems. And we will come, I promise we will come back to it, but I do want to, I do want to hear a little bit from, well, from Sean first. He's, he's very shy. I know, I know. Well, we can, we can ignore him. Uh, no, Sean, I just, I'd love to hear from you really how you've seen this market in this context, how you've seen it change since you've been in business and what you think the role of a gallery is in addressing what these guys are bringing up, which is a sort of alternative value. I think everybody on the panel has made really, really interesting points. I, I want to actually touch on a whole bunch of them. Um, I'm old enough that I was uh, sort of grew up in the art market in the 60s uh, when there was no money around for ha artists like Hans Harker. And artists were making art because they loved making art and they couldn't avoid doing it. And they did it from their hearts, not, not from their pocketbooks or their, or their investment accounts. Um, I think that there are not two markets. There are many, many, many markets. And all those markets are very different. The point I would really like to say is I think there's a massive crisis in the art world. And I think we're all skirting around it. I think uh, Lisa's point is a fantastic and well-made point. Um, <clears throat> what she's talking about is that there is enormous m market manipulation by certain ca cabals of dealers, by certain cabals of collectors with the auction houses, um, and if you're looking at those markets as an investable or portfolio option, you're having the wall pulled over your eyes because they're being massive, massively manipulated. Um, and there are lots of other markets. I'd like you to think about the art world as being in the same kind of existential crisis that the political world is in Brazil, in America, in France, in Britain, Brexit, and the ecological world is, which is in a huge crisis. And, you know, th for the art world to be talking about investment is the equivalent of us watching um, a polar bear floating past on an, I an ice cap and thinking the world's going to be fine. It's not. There are enormous crises in the art world right now. And one of the biggest ones for me is that collectors uh, and people who really care about art and love art have become so disenfranchised from the thing that they love and care about that it, you know, the market is turning them off. Now, I'm an art dealer, and it's very odd to hear an art dealer <laughs> saying something like that. I want to make money, I want my artist to be successful. But I think we really have to start thinking very carefully about where the value is attached to that success. And I'd like to point out, you know, Aggie Gunn selling her, her Liechtenstein for you know, a vast amount of money and putting it back into a program uh, to address the inequities in our prison systems. Another collector I heard about selling a Rothko, putting $80 million into um, supporting various different uh, initiatives in Africa. Uh, we've got an exhibition at the gallery right now where 
we're giving a proportion of the... We weren't asked to do it, we volunteered to do it. We're giving a portion of the proceeds of the sale of that work back to Women's Prison Association, which is something that we're very committed to. Um, I'm a trustee of Penn. Um, uh, you know, we're suing the President of the United States right now, quite mm. correctly, as far as I'm concerned. I think there are a lot of really important issues in the world right now, and there's an enormous amount of money in the art world, flowing through the art world, and I think we could all put it to much greater use than, than allowing people to manipulate value for an artist like Cause at auction because they're going to make more money. But has uh, a couple of things, Whee! yes. Oh, that was good. A <laughs> couple of things I want to pick up on there. Um, and I mean, I think, yes, I think we probably all, to a certain extent, agree and are watching this happen around us uh, slightly. But we shouldn't panicky. be watching it happen around that's us. We should be my, doing something. That's my about question. Um, what else? Can, I mean, amazing if you've got a, a 80 million, you know, to Rothko that you can sell and give to a great cause. But how, how can people use what you're saying and start to think about art differently? How, what is the value system you put on the, an artist? I think the value system is, is, about, uh, is about language and history. Um, nobody in this room can tell me who the most valuable Victorian painter of the age is because it is an illustrator who worked for the London Illustrated Evening News mm. and was making more money than uh, you know, all, all the most famous painters of the day. That artist is now forgotten. Um, most of the artists that we value intensely, and two of them that Dan showed, Brancusi and Van Gogh. Van Gogh failed to sell anything during his lifetime, and Marcel Duchamp was Brancusi's dealer and was hawking his wares around America trying to support the artist. Um, I think we have to look at value in a very different way. There's a, there's a, there's a schism or a rupture between monetary value and uh, intellectual capital. And I think those are two rather different things. And it's not at all to uh, have a go at what you're doing because yes, I totally agree with you. <laughs> and there are, you know, there, there are works that culturally also command enormous value and that is absolutely as it should be. But let's not forget that Rothko was not a high value artist during his lifetime. And now we've judged him to be a very important artist. And I think we have, to, we have to get back to thinking about connoisseurship and looking rather than listening and not thinking about investing, but thinking about our cultural capital and what we actually care about as human beings, which, by the way, historically is incredibly consistent. The value structures of humans are what they've liked through the ages, down from prehistoric times to now. That capital is enormously consistent. And I think that those things are the things that we need to be looking at and valuing rather more than the short term, you know, what did I pay for it? What's it worth now? And how can I unload it? Because, <laughs> I, I, because I really find that incredibly morally debilitating. I think you're I, right, I, I, too. I, it's also, you know, I grew up in New York during the Cedar Bar days when the artists would actually get together. They would talk about the literature that they were doing. It was the literature, the religion, the politics, the artwork. It all kind of swelled up together. Now there's so much competition, even getting into galleries, that artists are afraid to share any of the information for fear that somebody will jump, like turtle over them. And even we were talking about cause, this is from our data, you can see just from 2009 just to 2018, the jump that his record has made, to your point, because certain people in the art market want to raise the profile, they know people in the museums, they know people at the auction houses, it benefits their pocketbooks more than it does the cultural context. I, I totally agree, but let's be very honest. Cause is not being shown in museums. He's no. being, he's, and he, by the he, way, Lisa, he, 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 he is an in incredibly nice Asia. guy. Sure. He's a very, very sweet guy. Sorry. But he's, it, that's not where the value's coming from. It's coming from a group of dealers getting together and decide, deciding they need to make a load of money. They're pumping the value up. They're colluding with the auction houses. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, those of us who are in this business, it's as plain as the nose is on our face. And it's done season after season, uh, decade after decade, and those artists get washed through the system and washed away, and they've yes. gone again. And, you, you know, I mean, why, why are we not alive to this? Why are we not understanding it? I have to it? say, as an advisor, um, we've had the great privilege of working with various 
different types of collectors, different personalities, different price points. And one thing I learned actually recently is I watched an incredibly confident collector just totally ignore any of the market news, even people around him that were much closer to him than I was, kind of tell him, do this, do that. And he didn't care, and he just, he bought what he loved from his heart. And I watched, and I was like, wow, this confidence in a collector is so powerful. He's the one dictating value, not the auction prices, nobody else, just him. And I just, uh, I, 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 I think it seems like you two are, are those kinds of collectors, and I think we need more of those in the world. Well, let me raise yes, one please. point. We are talking about a lot of material art, so let's go into performing arts. Let's talk about Yvonne Rayner, Simone Forti, or even uh, Lia Rodriguez in Brazil, okay, that has an amazing project, uh, Favela da Maré. Okay? These guys are making zero money. They never made money, okay? They are, I don't know if they are ending their life with uh, dignity, <laughs> okay? So, and they exist. So how are, are, are we gonna address these problems? You know? But, uh, well, and there's a problem, I think, because the logical conclusion is the only way you can be a, a true artist untouched by the market is if you're super rich to begin with, because people need to, artists need to eat. And the system that has sort of fed them till now has but the market has helped so actually, haven't we I, 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 i'm going to interrupt for one second yeah, i, I feel like they're actually it's the opposite i i, I know don't i need to eat no no i know <laughs> i know personally an artist who came from a family with money who's a genius and making amazing art and he is detested because he yeah, came I'm from sure. money so there's always that no i'm sure and i'm not saying either is uh, it makes better art. I'm just saying that unless there's some system that pays for all of this, um, you know, I'm just thinking, is there an alternative there's system? There's no WPA anymore? <laughs> no. But the, the, the question really is, how much do you need to eat every no, day? That's fair enough. I mean, <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> I, 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 that's completely fair I, I'm enough. I'm sorry, but I mean, how many billionaires do we need? How many millionaires no, do I we agree. need? And, and, the, and the reality is... Uh, I, I've actually reached a point where, you know, you know I'm, Who's I'm happier? okay. I'm doing okay. I'm perfectly comfortable. I'm able to support my artists. And I am really worried about uh, my children and my newly minted grandchild of two weeks uh, looking at the world and thinking, you know, the art world is not separate to the ecology of the rest of the world. Yep. And how much money do we all need? Hmm. And, and the point really is, how much more do we need than all, and then everybody else in this room? Well, how much inequality. more do I need than you yeah. to be a better person and a better and a richer dealer? And it's just insane the way we're carrying on. Yeah, we don't need to do this. We, we need to... We I shopped online earlier today. I feel terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we obviously, we, it's not about naivete. We all want to be comfortable. We all want to have a good lifestyle. We, and I'm not arguing for anything naive, but the point really is, I think we've reached a tipping point, and the 1%, 99% mm. issue, which was very prevalent some time ago, and has quietened down a little bit more, we really need to rethink this, because the inequity, the imbalance in all walks of life is so profound now that it is unsustainable, whether it is the ecology or the art world, and we really need to rethink this. Well, I mean... Uh, I mean, this conversation has obviously gone in a very different direction than I to, thought it would. To anything we um, discussed beforehand, yeah, amazing. We're all going to go out and proclaim yeah. ourselves socialists. Um, but I, I think I when, you, when you take... <laughs> well, when you take the conversation back to where we were, investment connoisseurship, our collecting, its place in our lives, I think the one thing I would say, because I think people here are probably thinking about, okay, what do I do with all this information? Hmm. My advice is to slow it all down. And I think there's such a, an urgency. We're all being marketed uh, to by galleries, by Amazon, by Prada, by everybody all the time. And it's almost uh, like things are pinging in your brain that you've got to jump on these things. And the reality is there's always another artwork. There's always another uh, Dan and I, Dan, Dan and I did a panel in Miami in December. And Dan coined the phrase on that panel. It got picked up by the FT and by other people. Um, uh, the, he coined the slow art movement. 
And was I think that, was it's... That I, your, I, was that your... Because yeah, there and, is a real... And, and he's, a marketing, well, well, he's a marketing genius. Yeah, and I yes, think it's is. an absolutely no, brilliant but, term. And, you know, I'm so impressed when people... I'm talking to people and they say, oh, well, I've given up. I'm off Instagram. I'm off this. I'm off that. And they're actually walking around more present, more conscious, looking at art again in a very different way. And, you know, they're so much happier for it. And I think but, we do need to slow down the flow of information and, and see things differently and absorb information differently and well, be present in the world differently. I'll tell you a story about Sean and I. We, we had a, started a conversation about Joseph Kasuth, an artist that we both love, and we talked and talked. We, we, we spent a lot of time talking about Joseph Kasuth over a long period of time. There were a number of pieces that Sean put in front of me, some of which he urged me to, to buy because he thought they were really high quality for whatever reason content or how much was in my checking account at the time, it didn't happen. And finally, we landed on a piece. Um, and I, at the end of it all, because it had been going on a ridiculously long period of time, I went back in my email and found out that the first conversation we had about Kasuth and buying a piece was seven years before. <laughs> and it was painful for Sean. But at the end of the day, we ended up getting a piece that we absolutely love. And I walk by it every day. And I, it, it's a, you know, completely a part of our life. And I think that makes it more valuable. It was actually as much about the dialogue we had about the artist as it was about actually buying the piece. It was, you know, it became a part of, uh, of an ongoing conversation, which has well, value. <laughs> I just want to say it wasn't painful because we actually had incredible conversations and it was very enriching. And I know that that's a piece which will never be back on the market. Uh, and it was like selling it to a museum because I know that it was such a meaningful acquisition for Dan um, that I had placed an artwork by an artist I cared about, and it was in very safe hands. So it wasn't painful at all. It was actually very enriching. Sorry, Nemi, uh, did you not, want to say not something? Not being a car dealer. <laughs> you know? uh. But I have a funny story. Uh. There, well, we are flooded by emails and mm. PDFs and, and everything, you know. Uh, so there is a big gallery that starts sending me a senior partner and as time goes by, I didn't buy anything, so I was downgraded for an uh, associate. Then the same thing kept, kept going. I was downgraded again for an... Uh, and then, well, I, I, I've been downgraded three times now <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not buying. You know, but yeah. you never had this kind of conversation that these two guys had yeah. for, for seven years. You know, the, all they want is to stuff you with uh, artworks. <laughs> And if you don't, if you want artist X, you have to buy Y and Z. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and sometimes it just takes a while to figure out what some of these artists are trying to, to say and to learn. Yeah, I almost had to learn a couple of years worth of stuff to really understand why Kasuth was such an important yes. artist. And it takes, yeah. it takes a while. Yes, especially So I have a question art. for Sean. When you say, you know, you want to slow down the process of the purchasing, and I do think there's a proliferation of a lot of information that just gets retweeted and reposted and you're reading the same thing over and over again. But when you go to the art fairs, there's always the question, what did you sell? And the happiness of the director of the art fair needs to know how many galleries sold, how well did they sell, are they going to come back next year, will they be able to afford to come back next year? So as much as you want the people to start looking at artwork, ingesting it, getting more connoisseurship, don't you also have the concern that you need to make sure that you sell works from your booth to, to be able to sustain? Of course you do, but look, how, how much do I need to sell to, to pay for my booth and sustain it? I mean, I was amazed to be receiving uh, inquiries from the press at five o'clock on the first day of the art fair as to what I'd sold. I mean, it was the first day of the art fair. It was halfway through the first day of the art fair. And they're asking me what I'd sold. I mean, who cares what I sold? You know, no, I, d um, I mean, I actually, I, do, I and, think the and, press and, is part of And then of we the, got that inquiry. That is a system. huge part of the problem. <laughs> we All got, we see we, are I numbers. I didn't say problem, numbers, numbers, I said system. We, Sorry. Got <laughs> that, we got that inquiry yesterday, the second day. And Adair, who's sitting in the audience, I said, no, no comment, because ask me at the end of the art fair what I've sold. We're, we are now exactly halfway through the art fair. Ask maybe, me at the end maybe of the art fair. in a week, because you can convert yeah, sales afterwards. afterwards. But, but this to also ask goes me back to this, through the first day is, is It ridiculous. also goes back to this slowing down, because one of the things that's happened in my world is maybe we used to wait till the end of the fair, and then you get one publication that starts writing it a little earlier, and then it all gets, and everything gets, everything is faster. Okay? I don't know if it's 
globalization, technology, money, I don't know, all of the above. That is Look, the on, honestly, that I, 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 have... I, I'm not trying to be smart about this, but uh, I can guarantee you we probably sold as much, if not more, than nearly everybody else in this art fair. But I don't need to tell a journalist that six, six hours into an art fair um, where other dealers are very happy to say, I sold that for $25,000. I, I just find it's absolutely a stupid question. But I feel, I mean, I, I wonder if, I mean, the reason this was called from investment to connoisseurship is because, uh, oh, I said it the American way, um, but it's because I, I wonder actually if there is a movement going in the direction, I may be a bit more optimistic than you, um, and you talk about slow, you know, slow art, like we're, we're and there's food to fair. table, of course. And there's no. 20 art fairs I, every second, and like there aren't as many I, 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 as I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about this, and actually, Me too. And, and, okay. and actually, um, and actually, it's a conversation that Dan and I had. Uh, he is a collector of, about 18 months ago in his living room in Washington. He is a collector on a Sunday, we're talking, and myself as a dealer, and we were talking about how really depressed we were about the condition of the art world and how the level of conversation was, what did you buy, how much did it cost, what's it worth? And he was being bombarded by six sales representatives from a large gallery who are all trying to sell him the same thing, <laughs> who don't know, they, the they aren't coordinating. That's what at, I want to At know. the same or different price, prices. <laughs> and, and, and the only conversation is about value. And so we started a conversation about how do you address that? and actually collect wisely the podcast, which was the first about podcast cost, in the art not value. It came directly out of that conversation, and we do not talk about the gallery, and we do not talk to people about the market, and we do not talk about our artists. We only talk to collectors, because collectors, are the, you guys, are the first people in the door who support an artist and support a gallery. And you're doing it because you love the work. And that's incredibly valuable and important. And I wanted to find out why people are so passionate about that and, and still so enthusiastic. And it's been revelatory mm. and it has been restorative. And it's certainly restored my faith in what I do and, it is and, a, it's and a in what collectors podcast do. podcast I would highly, highly recommend. And it's been terribly well received. As in, that's what I, I think there is a genuine appetite. And I agree, yes, there are lots and lots of fairs and a lot, but even the fairs are evolving a but they're tapping into it. We just had a set of auctions in London that were a bit strained. I, I just think, and the values are coming down a bit. I think. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another reason why I, I'm actually optimistic uh, as well. And I, a lot of it to me is about the the community around yep. collecting. And so we were talking a few minutes ago, and uh, I guarantee you, in in three weeks, when Pedro comes to Washington, mm -hmm. he's going to come to my house. We're going to have coffee and we're gonna be in a conversation about the art that we love. And I think all over the art world, you find these pockets, and I see this a lot in the, the museum board work that I do, where it's just, it's people who really love uh, the same thing, spending a lot of time commuting around it. And, and in a way, it doesn't matter whether one's a billionaire and one's uh, you know, a, an underpaid curator or somebody who's just interested uh, but doesn't collect, but it's about this community around art and culture and I think that's it's it's alive and well. It's just not really the focus of the conversation that goes on in in the art world most of the time. Actually, maybe it is. Maybe the conversation is okay on this level. It's more the press, and I don't mean you, the press, but like the reported, like there's a, there's these numbers floating in the ether that are just it's attracting people who aren't in the art. It's difficult to ignore numbers when they're that high for everyone. This is not. I'm not defending me. I'm asking. You know, what, when prices are so high, how can people? ignore it. Well, it, it's obvious. It's like the Kardashian factor. You know, it, it's, it's much more interesting to, to tell a dirty story or a story about a lot of money than it is to tell a story about somebody who's helping, you know, impoverished children in Brazil. I mean, it's just human nature, isn't it? It sells newspapers, or if it doesn't sell newspapers, it sells e-space. Yes. Whatever it does, it's human nature. And that's normal. Nobody's having a go at anybody about it. But if we're really talking about value, and we're talking about the value of art, I did not become, uh, I was not a curator, a museum director, and become an art dealer. Uh, you know, it wasn't about making money for me. It was actually because I loved working with art and artists. And, you know, it's almost like you try and talk about these things, you sound naive, and I, I am not naive. 
I really do love what I do, and I love working with artists. I love That's being around people who love art, like yeah. the people on this panel do. And, and I think we've got to really think about that, not just about did it sell for $165 million? How much of it is still remaining to, that was painted by Leonardo da Vinci's hand, if it ever was? I mean, come <laughs> on. Go. We, we could be we, here all we, night we, if we, we start there. We've been doing this thoroughly since the, since the 40s in America in a very sophisticated way. Surely we're better than that. We can have a more sophisticated conversation Sorry, about yeah. art than just how much it's worth. But I also think that there's all these blockbuster gallery shows and museum shows, and to your point, the story about how you collected it, why you collected it, the history behind your effort in the Kosuth. I mean, that's what gives the richness, not only to the artwork, but to the collection. And if you just go into these big blockbuster shows, you lose that whole story. And all of these collections, a lot of these collections that are coming to sale now through estates, they started when all, as you said, these artists were not making money, they were nobody, they were, they were there to support art and culture which is hopefully what everybody's trying here to do in their ways. Uh, but even though coming, going back to that story coming from an auction house background, there is these moments where people do have money and it's free press if you raise your hand, the last paddle, yeah. at a very high price, yeah. all of a sudden the camera shift all yeah. the way in the back of the room yeah. because of course they weren't sitting up in the front because they didn't have a ticket to sit down. Yeah. And this person all of a sudden became yeah. the biggest thing and the galleries would call them, and they could get that artwork the next day, because there is that component to it. But Pedro, I think you were going to say that you feel, I want to end with optimism before I open it up. You, you say you, that you maybe feel optimistic? Well, the same page you agree as, with, yeah. uh, as, as Dan and Sean. Yeah. You know, I think that there is engagement. You know, people are uh, trying to, you know, to do residencies and travel people abroad and support institutions support not-for-profit institutions all over the world. So I'm pretty optimistic. This is the only, this is the only thing that I'm optimistic about <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. this we day. We have to actually. cling on to something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on that note, um, oh my goodness, we already have a question. That's wonderful. Um, this gentleman here, oh, sorry. I'm That's bringing you a mic. That's a well, Hi. a comment and a question. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, okay. yeah. So um, the comment is, um, I think you all gave an example of Brian Donnelly, and I think his ears are probably burning right now. But uh, Brian Donnelly meaning Cos, that's his real name. But um, just an interesting point is you discussed about auctions, and it's sort of from a little bit more negative about a lot of speculation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right now, point in case, uh, this painting is a fat Albert, the person who purchased it for not a lot of money, and he, he really likes it. And obviously, uh, he received a lot of money, multi-million dollars, it was a record. But he is literally using this money to support many other artists, and I know it in fact, and to support artists, and he's not hold, he decided, he literally buys tens of paintings of other artists who are not as, you know, hip, and I don't necessarily find something wrong with that. Now, no, no. And I don't think anyone was, is actually criticizing someone, you know, in any individual. Um, um, it was more the system. Yeah. It's the system around. Well, but the, the system around is also, it's not just about course. It's about yeah. Bradford. It's Absolutely. around many other. Oh, and the yeah. galleries are the ones who are raising prices astronomically. Hmm. I mean, Mark Bradford's work went from you know, 700,000 primary market for a large painting while he was with White Cube to $3 million. And so it's an ecosystem. No, I, and I it's, suspect, it's, it's I suspect our auctions. panelists here would agree that it, it isn't just about auctions and that there are mega galleries that are complicit yeah, just a, as well. Um, it, it, uh, it, it's I, not just, so, can I oh, just sorry, address that? that? It, I, I have a very pointed question after it, that, it, go it, ahead. It's not, it's not just that. I mean, his market went from five or 600,000, as you've said, uh, to over four million, uh, you know, that's a gallery making a decision about how they're going to conduct their business. But it was even more egregious than that because if you want to buy one now, you're told that you have to buy two and give one to a museum yeah. of, of uh, the gallery's uh, choice. I find that as a gallerist wrong. disgusting. I agree. So uh, disgusting. Now, pointed question. Pointed question. Case in point. I have a friend. 
he made a lot of money on the internet. He's 29 years old, okay? okay. He went literally from buying cars. Single? From buy, buy, <laughs> from, uh, Sorry, carry on, ha carry on. Has actually a girlfriend <laughs> for many years, very loyal. So the bottom line is he went literally from buying ten to $15,000 street art to $1.3 million purchase. And you know, he kind of, you know, he's a good friend. And now he is asked, I can see his taste. As his taste is based not on history. He's part of the sort of the new culture, the new wave. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really have time to read the Van Gogh books and history books. He goes by his instincts. So the question here is, mm -hmm. he's asking me, what should I buy? What, <laughs> would you, what you would tell me? Good question. I'm going to hand that to the experts. I what guess should he, he buy? should keep on buying the one, two, three, four, five million dollars. You know, we can have a cut of this, right? So, why buy a $5,000 artwork? Perhaps it makes no should, sense. Perhaps you should advise him to go and buy work from galleries who do the heavy, heavy lifting every day with the artists, where the artist is going to get some profit from his acquisition instead of buying from an auction house where the only people who are going to get the profit is the auction house. Well, that is actually that is a problem going that back to sometimes he's just the only buying way. Buying with his ears. Yeah. Sorry, when you're only looking. I mean, as an advisor, we have people approach us often thinking we can give them special access. And and to me, it's, this is like the worst person ever. It's like there's a list. It's the same list changes every couple of weeks, but it's a list of Mark things Bradford. they want, and it's yeah. it's not coming from anything but his ears. It's like buying stock that you're sniffing about. And I think he's not, that he needs to stop and slow down and go look. Tell him to With read them. some books. Yeah. Take a break books. from the internet and read some books. I guess he's gonna enjoy, he's gonna have a very pleasant time. Because it's really, really good to read some books. I love that. Let's go read some, are there any more questions? Yes, there's one at the front. Hi, Maggie, hi. There's, sorry, Maggie Carrigan from the art newspaper, hi. <laughs> Oh, she's giving me away now. Um, <laughs> um, I have a question that was actually spurred by Sean's comment about, and it'll come as no surprise now that I've been revealed as with the art newspaper, um, about, <laughs> no, no problem, about um, your lack of interest in, report, in, in sales reports at fairs. Um, my question to that is, and I would welcome comments from anyone on, on the panel on it, is that a big question that I have as a reporter that has to report on these sales, which I um, don't disagree with you, they can be incredibly futile, um, is one thing I, I come up against in, in the art market in general is the opacity of the market and the unwillingness of anyone to disclose prices and the, how that has fueled, in large part, the incredible inflation we've seen over the past decade or so. So I'm wondering what does responsible reportage of these prices look like and does not, isn't the effort to report pricing on and the, you know, the cost of these works part of establishing or empowering people to knowledge and effectively building connoisseurship in some way? Listen, I, I'm very happy to discuss prices. Um, you know, the Kinder Wiley painting that we had on the booth that we sold was $250,000. It's no longer there. It's safe to assume that we sold it. We sold it. Um, I'm happy to do that. But this constant urgent need for information about pricing. It's like going to a football match and asking 20 minutes in if, the, if your team has won the game. Well, you won't know until 90 minutes when the game's over. The fair finishes in five days. I'm happy to, you know, come and talk to me. I'll tell you exactly what I sold. Um, but I, I just don't think this urgent interim reporting about value is particularly helpful. I, I have to say, it's funny, we're like in a vicious cycle, but I do believe if there were one bucket on a price database where I could see primary pricing and secondary pricing, that I, we would shift off a lot of the problems we have, but that is not about answering that question within the first But I think also day. the fetishing about price would go, I actually think there's a fetishing about price because it's been opaque. I think, it, you know, it's also, that, that, yeah, I agree, get rid of it, let's just all know, and then we can look at things in other and ways. some right. galleries don't want to actually tell you, and for fear that maybe something didn't sell, for the price that it was at. And there, truly, the value is the value, whether it sells or it doesn't. You can't diminish it just because there wasn't that 
I don't know that you can do that. I think that there are there are prices that artists have. There's flavors of the month, and, and they can they can ebb and I, flow. I actually think that there should be a rule that you can't ask the question to anybody until the end until of the, the fair, because yeah, there is a like weird that. jujube. <laughs> Like, there's some shit you'll put down on an artist if it didn't sell right away. Well, or, here's, you know. but, but here's the, the interesting thing for me. I've, I'm in advertising, marketing, communications, not in the art world, but you recognize why people do what they do. And, it, and it's about creating a sense of momentum. And it can be completely false momentum, or it can be a smokescreen. You know, I, I view it all as good marketing, but well, sometimes good marketing PR. in the short term ends up, um, you know, throwing as people... Lies. Yeah. yeah, or 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 just as as what it is, marketing as opposed to reality. I, yes. I just want to say something very quickly. There, there is a law in New York City. There are about eight hundred and fifty to nine hundred galleries in New York, mm -hmm. and there is a law in New York City that every gallery has to display a price list. If you go into a gallery and there isn't a price list, and you ask to see one, they won't give it to you. That's yes. illegal. And I don't see what the problem with telling people what prices are. Mm -hmm. it, that's what our job is. We're here to educate people. Let's not forget that's the most important part of what we're there to do. And I personally uh, find it quite offensive when I go onto somebody's booth and say, how much, was, how much is that? And they go, it's sold. And then I say, how much, how much was for? it? And they won't tell me the price. I think it's insane. And I mean, sometimes you go to those it's, not a, it's not a trade there. secret. And One they more. put the red dots on them, even though the red dots, even though they haven't sold. I, re I really think, you know, just the level of manipulation of even basic information is unhelpful to the art world. Mm. And we've got time for one more question. So this lady here has been waiting very, very patiently. And, but, and I know it's going to be a short, snappy, intelligent question. Uh, I, 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 I <laughs> describe my uh, approach to collecting. I'm a, a collector and a computer scientist, also married to a computer scientist. My husband's an expert in data mining and big data. So four years ago, we uh, started uh, growing a system uh, which is called Articker. We follow in, in media globally 300,000 artists from 5,000 sources that we collect da daily information. And we have the largest dynamic database about media presence. And there's a great correlation between like art, either like new artists breaking or artists who come back to the market and the great correlation between prices and, and oh, what you sure. follow. So right now we is are at the a, juncture. Is there a question? Sorry? Is, we, the is que there a question? So my question is, you know, what we do with this uh, tool, because we can give it to collectors who are sophisticated enough to make decision about what is in the data. And you can actually, for example, we were on, uh, we found on the radar very early Christina Quarlet and Chabalala self, because but before gonna, they can broke. I, can I ask you a question for so you, which is, you know, what, so my would they, would, yeah, so what my collectors question use? Is how this tool can be used in yeah. the art market. Would you, would you use, as collectors, would you use a, a, a tool, like a, an analytical tool? You have to tell me. <laughs> How do you use? What are you doing this for? You know the reason, don't you? And she has no longer got her microphone. I took her um, mic. But what you're saying that actually it, it's not necessarily useful to you at your for level. Me? No. Not really. Okay. I think art is so much more about smell and intuition and I mean, these data reports and graphs and everything, it's like, great, sorry, I'm sure you need them on some level. <laughs> but um, I think it's a lot of Michigas. <laughs> well, you guys know the Walid Had work, APT, the Artist Pension Trust. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. APT, yeah. There are a lot of people uh, gathering data, and these guys put together a gigantic collection yeah. that uh, from one day or the other, this will flood the market. So there is quite a bit of speculation. And uh, for you that is in data mining, I, I go back to one uh, Ian Wilson work that's a very important artist that actually Donald Rumsfeld, right before invading um, Afghanistan, bombing the first time. And uh, they, Donald Rumsfeld said like this, there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. This is what I'm looking for. So. You know. Actually, you have reminded me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end. Dan, you gave me a great, was it an Ed Ruscha quote? 
um, about about what uh, it, w when someone goes to see art, when they see a work of art, they shouldn't say, what was it, well, well, well the, the quote is, uh, is a, a great David work of art should have you say, huh, wow, as opposed to wow, huh. So I, I think, and I think you should all go out into the fair and think, huh, wow. So that is how I'm going to end it. I cannot thank you enough. Sean, Nemi, Pedro, Dan, Lisa, you...